Hey guys, it is Sunday mailbag time. Always a good day here at the Collider Video Studio because I get to talk movies with this guy and maybe a little Dr. Sleep. Oh, <laughs> Sunday. Oh, talking questions, talking your questions. You know the drill. I mm. love Sundays. <laughs> That's really dramatic. <laughs> I'm thinking. I was waiting for you. You were supposed to back me up there going, yes, indeed. We yes, love the indeed. Sundays. Sundays. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. They're great. They are great. Yeah. I think that the new Jaws for our mailbag, though, is becoming Dr. Dr. Sleep. Sleep. Yeah, we're going to I start, can't help it. We're going to make I references. I swear, people keep sending these questions in, and I'm obviously going to pick them for yeah, it, as long as I can, at least. Well, and I have finished the book, finally, so I can now speak on it completely. By nope. the time this airs, I might have finished it. Yeah. But by the time we're recording, I have three hours of my audiobook left, and it's killing me. Three hours left, I know. And I, every day I keep wanting to talk to you about it, but I'm looking forward to you reading Jaws soon, soon which after. Which is going to be next. Which is a Jaws reference for those keeping score at home. <laughs> but I'll work another one in. Don't worry. I would hope so. Okay. All right, question number one today comes from Nathan, who writes, Hello, I'm a huge fan of Stephen King books, having <gasps> read a majority of them. For those of us that have read The Shining, we know that the two mediums end very differently. Would it have been better to remake, readapt The Shining in order to set up Dr. Sleep rather than diving straight into Dr. Sleep? Thanks. I'll let you go first. Oh, that's a good question. I have a lot of thoughts that, on that That one. is such a good question. Mm -hmm. um, the Shining is interesting because it is a beloved horror classic movie that the genre fans, including me, I love The Shining movie. I happen to like the book more, but I tend to like books more than the movie because you get more in the book. You have a little bit more going. I'm a Stephen King fan. I've been reading his books since I was 10, 11 years old. But remaking The Shining is interesting because it is a Stanley Kubrick film. Mm -hmm. I imagine that people would lose their mind if you said remaking The Shining. Now, they did remake The Shining. They did mm -hmm. a version of the book. It was straight to TV. We haven't seen it. I haven't seen yeah. it. I know it. That's the version Stephen King likes. He, at the end of the book, Dr. Sleep, he does an author's note, a little footnote, or he thanks some people, but he also takes The Shining to the cleaners. Doesn't like it, doesn't like the Stanley Kubrick version. That's fine, he's the author of this book, he created this world. For me, the head canon I'm going with is that you can start with Dr. Sleep and you can not necessarily tie it to The Shining, mm -hmm. the movie that is, but you can jump off of there by just saying Danny Torrance has grown up and he still has The Shining powers. That's it. I don't know how far they're gonna go into the Dr. Sleep book to explain some things. Now, in the book, Dr. Sleep, Danny does mention uh, his, the events at the Overlook Hotel, but it, you know, and he does talk about the original ending of that book. Now, that's his inner thought, so whether it'll translate on screen is another thing, if he has just some kind of soliloquy about like, oh, in my time at the Overlook Hotel. Mm -hmm. So, but headcanon, if you just go, little boy grown up with Shining, go from there, you can kind of fudge it, but we've talked about this, that because of the success of It, they're going after Stephen King titles and hopefully recreating or at least getting some good box office with, this is a Stephen King book, come check it out. But I've been talking a lot, so why don't you talk, Perry? <laughs> I know, I, I like your thoughts because okay. I, I think you're on the right track here. You know, I'm a little obsessed with Dr. Sleep, as you all well know at this point. It's, it's so good. I'm a little sensitive about the idea of them changing things, which, you know, I know isn't really fair. When you adapt any kind of material to film, you're changing the medium, and for it to better suit the film format, you're going to need to make certain changes. And also, I understand from a financial perspective, too, it is a much smarter business decision to make sure that their version of Dr. Sleep, this new film version, directly ties to the Shining movie more so than it does the book, making that the priority instead of the source material. But had this question been posed to me before I read The Shining, mm. I would have said, like, you know, whatever, just make the best movie you possibly could. There's details in The Shining book that they don't ruin my enjoyment of the movie because I still greatly appreciate that as an iconic piece of cinema, a haunted house story, but there's certain character details in that book, certain character details that influence how I feel about how Danny's behaving in this story Yeah, that makes me think 
stay true to the book source material. And if it didn't pop up in the first film, whatever. Because I just, I want a straight adaptation of this book. But that being said, there aren't too many details that I think people who are unfamiliar with the book versus the movie right. are not going to understand right. if it wasn't in the first movie. There is only one plot thing that... And again, I'm not finished at the time of recording this. I'm not finished with the book, so I don't know how big of uh, an influence it's going to play. But there's a certain location that if we didn't have the ending in the book, mm. I don't know if that location is going to work as well, if you know what I mean. Yes, I know what you're referring to. We're trying to stay away from spoilers right now, if you can read into this, because you haven't even gotten to a certain point. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to stop it there. It is really, it's going to be a delicate tightrope walk for these filmmakers because there are references. I mean, look, there are references to The Shining, the book, in Doctor mm -hmm. Sleep. So headcanon or otherwise, it's going to be very interesting. I think ultimately, because it's Flanagan directing this thing and uh, it's Doctor Sleep, I think they're just going to go with a straight, adaptation and just hope for the best because you need to but man we'll we'll, we'll talk about this we'll talk off camera there is yeah, yeah. Uh, there is something that <laughs> That's happens all we do here there is something i can't even talk anymore every single time we i can't start, talk anymore we start I a day all of a sudden mark riley appears in my doorway and he just looks at me and i don't have to even ask you or wait for your question i'm just like i've read this much more this is where i'm at let's talk about it yeah i just can't wait for you to hit that ending because oh, that's man. that's everything i'm sad to though because i i don't want to have no book left well that's why i had to tweet stephen king and say thank you very much oh, for the book because man. it did make me cry i'm not kidding oh, you boy. i did have tears I need to make sure i'm not running when i listen oh, to the end man. of it because if i'm running and i start crying on the track i'm just gonna you, be kind of embarrassed you, you never know why a, a scary book is gonna make riley cry but there here we are and i'm reading the book and my girlfriend at home goes why are you crying i go it's all right it's fine it's fine yeah it's one of those books i love it before this the waterworks kick in again yeah <laughs> do you want to move on we'll where, move are we on. Go where are we going next are we going Three? back to marvel yes we are yeah omar writes hi collider crew thanks for the show i watch it every day while doing boring paperwork at my job my question pertains to kevin feige <laughs> and his executive team letting directors have more of a free reign in shaping marvel movies in recent days i've heard some of you guys gushing about feige letting directors have a creative hand such as ryan coogler's vision for black panther and taika watiti's Thor movie, but I remember not long ago directors being frustrated with the managerial process at Marvel. Joss Whedon left because of frustrations, as well as Edgar Wright not directing Ant-Man due to creative differences. As he put it, I want to make a Marvel film, but they didn't want to make an Edgar Wright film. Do you think Marvel and Feige have changed and learned lessons from the past, or is Marvel still sticking to its game plan they've had for all these years? Great question. Anything come to mind on that one? I think their game plan has changed because my best example is Taika Waititi's Thor Ragnarok. Mm -hmm. That is, I mean, that is Taika Waititi's voice inside the Marvel sandbox. That, I mean, look, everybody came out of this thing going, that's one of the funniest Marvel movies I've ever seen. And I remember a lot of people coming at me online saying how disappointed they were that there wasn't a dark, gritty Ragnarok based on the comics because it's the apocalypse in, in Asgard. So, and that there was so much mist from that dark story from Taika Waititi's vision. So it gives me the confidence to say, I think they really have changed their game plan and are letting these directors do a lot more. However, there, it is Marvel. It is a shared universe. It is setting up movies after their, their takes. So I think that you have to find that director that can maintain their voice, but still follow the parameters given by Kevin Feige and rightly so. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a little, there's been a little bit of a change, but nobody's immune to these things. I do think that there still could be a director that leaves a Marvel movie over creative differences. It's, it's bound to happen. It can happen. It happens all the time. And I think it could happen and, and we'd mm -hmm. be, then the, the, then it would change. Well, Taika Waititi did it, but I think Joss Whedon, um, him leaving after, Age of Ultron, he seemed very tired. He seemed very like overwhelmed. And there was a lot of pressure on him. Mind you, he, it was coming after the Avengers, mm -hmm. a billion dollar movie in the Marvel cin Cinematic Universe. And for we didn't go into directing that. There was a lot of pressure on him because we're in phase two now and they're still going. Now we're in phase three and going into phase four. You know, 
I don't know. I think there's been some little changes. Yeah, I, I would say so as well. I mean, the movies that are specifically mentioned here, you know, Joss Whedon after Ultron and Ant-Man, I feel like that is when a shift did kind of happen where they had the ability to give more creative control. I've been thinking about this a lot lately, especially with everything that's happening with Star Wars right now. Mm -hmm. As much as I would like to see big franchises hire directors that I admire and give them full creative control, it is abundantly clear that there's something to be said for making a film fit within a franchise. And maybe even more importantly, just establishing that basis so then you can branch off into other directions. Because if you do that too soon, you're not giving your existing fan base that you want, you you run the possibility of rattling the foundation. So you need to earn the ability to be able to do that. And I get the sense that Marvel kind of did that mm -hmm. with around the Ultron time and then testing the waters with Ant-Man. And, you know, for all I know, maybe Edgar Wright was just pushing it a little too far for Kevin Feige's liking. And I'm not even saying that that ultimate decision was even Feige's and not, you know, some other, I, other people involved in exactly. it too. But... Kevin Feige and the other higher-ups at Marvel, they're not just responsible for saying, oh, I'm going to hire you and give you full creative control. They're also uh, in charge of you know, spearheading and main maintaining the success of the operation and the franchise overall. So it's these two things that you have to weigh, making a good film, but also a film that feels different because once you've established that foundation, if you don't tread into new territory, then you're gonna sink your ship in the exact opposite way. Right. So you gotta weigh that, but then you gotta weigh the fact that, I mean, these franchises, they are all cinematic universes. They're all connected and you need to respect that all the way through or otherwise that will ruin the foundation. So it's juggling all these things. So as much as I do think the creative control from a great director, like, you know, let's say someone like Edgar Wright, Taika Waititi, James Gunn, I think it's of the utmost importance in order to make something different work, but you do need to consider the other side of it Otherwise, it might not pan out well. Yeah, and I think there are inherent visions uh, that are shared with like directors like Kugler and Feige, where they get on the same page. Maybe it's just a like serendipitous. They mm -hmm. meet and they just and yeah. they get it and they move forward with it. And w with Whedon, it you know it really looked like towards the end of Ultron, he was just tired, you know. And maybe that's a lot of uh, things. Like you know, Steven Spielberg was offered Jaws too. There you go reference he was too he didn't want to go back to the water he was like nope he still steven spielberg still has anxiety dreams waking up on oh the set God. of jaws so that's why he didn't want to do jaws 2 which is a worthy sequel i might add i think it's a not not a bad <laughs> sequel worthy maybe that's too strong a word anyways there's your jaws reference for your sunday mailbag oh all right <laughs> well now that we've checked that box question mm. number four comes from jessica who writes so in hindsight, did releasing a trailer so late work in Disney's favor for Solo? Could this lead other studios to follow a similar marketing schedule? Whew. Here's another thing I've been thinking about quite Whoa. a bit because you know that I was probably one of the more heated about mm -hmm. us not getting a Solo trailer. And, yeah. you know, it wasn't so much about like, you know, give me what I expect from you. It has nothing to do with that, really. But, you know, this industry did set certain standards and expectations. And when those expectations aren't met to a degree, that's when the red flag does go up. And, yeah, I care about the Star Wars film franchise. I care about this movie being good. So when I hadn't gotten a trailer, I, I started to get more nervous than I had ever been, even though I'd always like to give these companies the benefit of the doubt and hope that they're respecting this iconic character that I love so much. But I was getting really, really nervous. Then the trailer finally came for Super Bowl. Actually, I'll backtrack track a little. First, the announcement came that we will likely see something at Super Bowl and, mm -hmm. the, and the full teaser trailer will be released during Good Morning America. Right. And I started to think, you know, that's not that bad of an idea start to plant the seeds, Super Bowl, when you have the most eyes on a trailer teaser of sorts, and then have everyone go nuts with a full, with a more full trailer, a full teaser trailer the next day. That's, that's not a bad idea, because then you can have the best of both worlds, the Super Bowl audience, but then also having a day that's kind of your day, yeah. which I think Solo did accomplish. So I'm starting to think that, in hindsight, I think they're, I don't think that they would have chosen this path had there not been production issues, but given the cards that they were dealt and couldn't get around, 
I do think thus far that they're making the most out of this opportunity. They're making the most of it. Whether it worked in their favor, that's debatable. I think that because of all the problems, I think it's already passed that there was an issue. We didn't get something soon. So what I saw after the solo trailer dropped on Good Morning America, the Super Bowl spot was interesting because we hadn't seen anything. It was very short. It was very dynamic. The look of it was fantastic. You didn't hear Alden speak that much. The, the, the jury was still out. It was still the Super Bowl. You had a lot going on. But overall, I saw positive from that. Mm -hmm. It was when it debuted at Good Morning America that I started to see the pushback. And I started to see some people saying it looks like garbage. Mm -hmm. He doesn't look like Han Solo. He doesn't sound like Han Solo. But I love Lando. That's the one thing yeah. that everybody's really Everyone saying. Does. I love Lando. I love the look of Chewbacca. I love some of the, the looks and the shots. So I think it's... It, I think Disney ultimately missed the opportunity here mm -hmm. by not doing a trailer earlier. But here's what I've learned over the last weekend. There are still people, casual movie going audiences that are basically saying, I have no idea what movie this is. My cousin, I'm having a barbecue, said, have you seen The Last Jedi yet? He went, no, you know, I saw the, the second one. And it confused me because it didn't really cut together with the first one. So I, 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 I think I'm behind for the third one. I said, oh, <laughs> okay, you, you saw Rogue One. Yeah. He thought it was the second one. Now, don't go yelling at my cousin. He, he's not a huge Star Wars fan like we are, but that's the thing. They are looking at these movies, and it's a Star Wars movie, and they think it's all connected, which it is, but it's not Last Jedi and Episode Nine that we're getting for, like, I know it. My mom's going to call me and go, wait a minute. <laughs> Where's Ray? You know, she's gonna do it. And it's yeah. called Solo, like Hansa. Where's Harrison Ford? They're, the casual going movie audience is really like, I, I, I'm sorry, maybe it's just my family. They're no, confused. It's, it's not. They're confused. So maybe let's put it out there. Like, are you finding it confusing in your own discussions? The hardcore Star Wars fan, you get it. But like, are you finding yourselves in conversations having to explain, like, no, 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 this is a spinoff. No, 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 this isn't, you know, Star Wars, you know, the sequel trilogy part three. This is in episode nine. This is Han Solo's movie. This is young Han Solo. Oh, oh. So it, it is starting to get confusing. So it's really interesting. If Disney didn't put this sooner, then we have Last Jedi on theaters. And they're like, what? What's going on? Casual movie going audience, I think, are, are getting a little confused at all the Star Wars movies out there. It's, it's a fair thing. And it's, it's not just your family, because when I had taken some people to see Rogue One, someone did ask me the same question, where oh, yeah. is Rey? And I had to explain the timeline. And then they went, oh, I get it now. But yeah, yeah. I can, I can see how someone might have that response. And the other response that I've seen on, on a lot of the Twitter comments and comment sections about the Han Solo trailer, something you brought up, where Alden Ehrenreich isn't really working for people. And that's a complaint that I can kind of understand because yeah. that is the major challenge that they face the second they announce this thing is you can't get Harrison Ford to play a young Han Solo. And right. no matter how good his performance is, he has an immense challenge ahead of him to, to earn people's but that trust is the wrong word, but, but belief in him, like earn the ability or the, the I, I don't know what the word is, but earn the right for people to watch him on camera as Han Solo and believe he's Han Solo. Yeah. And not just believe that he's making his own Han Solo, but believe that he is he is Harrison Ford's Han Solo. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's unenviable what he has to, to put up with. I mean, you know, especially in the world we're in now, especially social media mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there is a divisiveness in Star Wars fandom right now because of The Last Jedi. We might get it with Solo and it might be all directed at this actor. And um, I, I hope that's not the case. I hope, like, I, I hope more than anything is because I enjoy his work, mm -hmm. his body of work before this, is that he's given a chance. I'm certainly giving him a chance, but it is hard. I am a diehard Star Wars fan. It is hard to look at a Han Solo character, and not go, where's Harrison? Yeah. And that's just inevitable. We'll see what happens. I think if he really it just inhabits the role and we disappear into the story and all of a sudden it ends and you're like, well, that was a good movie, yeah. well, then we'll have another conversation after the movie. Remains to be seen. All right, we're going to wrap this up on a lighter Star Wars note. Oh, okay, this good. question comes from Max, who writes, Love all things Collider, especially the movie news and Star Wars. 
Topic, great movies that need to be remade, but in the Star Wars universe, it touches on some earlier points of wanting to get away from existing characters, go somewhere different, and maybe retcon a few things where possible. Some examples, Hunt for Red October, Crimson Tide, an Empire captain defecting to the Rebellion, orders that were unfollowable, no way out, an undercover spy given the job of finding a spy who then turns out to be a spy himself within the Rebellion, or even a movie like American Assassin or Zero Dark Thirty where a team of civilians hunt down a rebel or some rebel cell. No Jedi or lightsabers. Just a movie that makes you see the rebels as evil from a certain point of view. Would love to hear the Collider team's choices for this idea. Great. I love this idea mm. quite a bit. But I'm going to veer in a completely different direction because... Ooh. With, with Star Wars, I really do want something different. I brought up that Death Trooper book, and I doubt yeah. it'll ever happen, but I really do want to see a horror movie set in the Star Wars film franchise. But yeah. the other thing that I think we had brought up on a show recently is, you know, why aren't we getting more good coming-of-age stories, especially hot on the heels of It? I think someone said remake The Goonies, which I, I got to think through a little bit more, but it did lead me to this. What if we get a Stand By Me or Goonie story, but set in the Star Wars world. Because have we ever seen, like, a young group of friends, and I'm not talking about a young group of heroes fighting the Empire. I'm talking about a, a group of friends just, like, being kids, going out, and not necessarily finding a dead body, a treasure hunt, really anything. Young Luke Skywalker meets up with all of his friends and has a, an adventure on the Tatooine Desert. He finds some kind of map. Maybe there's some power converters buried somewhere near the Sarlacc, and they're going to go check it out. There's your movie, Coming of Age with Luke Skywalker. I'm into that. That'd be funny. I'm into that. I, I love this idea. I've been wanting a horror movie set inside mm. the Star Wars universe. These are some great examples. How about when Han met Leia? A little romantic comedy. Oh, wait, we know how yeah. Han met Leia. <laughs> I was like, wait, I'm wait kidding. a second. Um, yeah, you, you know, it'd be or interesting. Or even just like, I don't know if this would make any sense, but like, Han and Leia go on a date, but not that specific, but even just where, like, I wouldn't even mind a short, a short film mm -hmm. where they do just go to, because what comes to mind right now is in Rebel, Rebel Rising, I believe, there's a bit where, where one character is just living with, with a, another family, mm -hmm. and you get those, those quieter, more intimate moments, and, and in a setting that feels real, like, you know, like a movie theater or a bar or a restaurant. It like took place somewhere where I could instantly put myself there or like a bar, like a cantina set type thing. Mm. I, I, I'm a sucker for a political thriller. And after I read Bloodline, I'm like, wow, this is like mm -hmm. very much like, a, you mentioned No Way Out. Um, that, that's a great kind of political thriller. Um, Bloodline is a political thriller, if you think about it. I would love to see something either set in the prequel era or past the Empire, but in the New Republic right before Force Awakens. What's going on there? Is there like some political intrigue? Because the one thing I have been missing from the sequel trilogy, I don't know what's going on in the politics of the Republic, other than they've been blown out of the sky by the First Order. So to set something up there, are there sleeper cells, of, uh, like a, a mole or something from the First Order where they do want to like assassinate the New Republic or Something Maybe. like that might be really cool Just to the see. The moments leading up to that explosion, too. The moments have, leading up to it. We have Cor on there, yeah, and that's we know right. where she is. So. Yeah, that's right. So I, I like that idea. I'm still for the horror um, yeah. version. I think that would be fun. Well, the, the horror version that crossed my mind is what if it was Silence of the Lambs, but Ooh. in Star Wars, where it's a hunt for a serial killer. Ooh. I like that. I'm into that idea. Wouldn't that be crazy if there was like a, like a killer on the loose in the galaxy? And there's like... I would want that. <laughs> Ooh, I like this. That's a good idea. And okay. then my last That's like, my pick. really off the rails idea is like, what's the Star Wars equivalent to high school that isn't the Imperial Academy? Like, what, what would it look like if I got a Mean Girls version of Star Wars? Oh my God, I do not I can't know. help it. Didn't you I read? Just, I just went down this rabbit hole and... What about Leia, Princess of Alderaan in that book? Is, is there like any kind of stuff there where it's like... It's, I mean, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the same because it's not like a traditional thing where it's like high schools all over the galaxy in different towns on different planets. She's in a very specific program, mm -hmm. and I feel like nobody in the program would behave like they do in Mean Girls. And that's okay. What, and then the other idea, I have one more idea. I had way too much fun with this question. We need more Star Wars sports. Like, yeah. what do what do kids in school in Star Wars? 
play like for school sports because now I want a Sandlot version. I know of Star Wars. Don't they play Quidditch? Wrong. No, yeah. no, 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 yeah. no. That was wrong. That was wrong. But I would also watch a Quidditch movie. I don't know. I mean, you know, you could look at you know Luke Bullseye and Womp Rats and his T sixteen. It's kind of, I don't know. Maybe that's his after school program. But that sounds like driving school. So I don't know. Maybe yeah. it's at drivers, drivers, drivers ed, ed drivers ed in the T sixteen. <laughs> That might work. I had too much. I'd watch question. anything in the Star Wars universe. I mean, come on. All right. So I want to put this one to you guys now because I love Max's question. Yeah. Do you have an idea for a movie that we know that should be remade, but in the Star Wars setting? Because this is fun and I want to know what you guys think. I like this. That's what we got for you today. If you guys want one of your questions answered on this show, it's super easy. All you got to do is send it on over to collidervideo at gmail.com. Maybe we pick it for this show. Maybe we pick it for an episode of Movie Talk. Who knows? Mark Riley, thank mm. you for being here with me today. Thank Where can you. everyone find you on the internet? At Riley Around on Twitter and Instagram. And it's uh, at P. Nemiroff on Twitter and Instagram for me. Thank you again for watching. Please like and share this video. And don't forget, subscribe to the Collider Video YouTube channel. You know what? Tell everyone you know to do that too. Bye, guys. Hey, everybody. Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.